A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindi newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 27th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Now look at this snow filled picture from Amherst, New York. See this picture came in the front page of the newspaper. See this condition is due to the recent bomb cyclone named Elliot. So in our discussion today we'll see about bomb cyclone, how it is formed, its effects and finally how it differs from normal cyclones. See first of all you have to know that bomb cyclones are associated with temperate cyclones. So they mainly occur in temperate region where the warm air mass meets with the cold air mass. So what is an air mass? See air mass is a large volume of air with uniform temperature and moisture. See when air stays over a surface for a long period of time it gets the characteristics of the surface. To understand this let us look at the winter months in North America. See during winters in North America the land area becomes extremely cold very fastly but the Atlantic Ocean stays relatively warm. So the air above the land mass becomes very cold and it has less moisture and this is the cold air mass and the air above the Atlantic Ocean is warm and it has more moisture and this is the warm air mass. When the warm air mass and the cold air mass meet two fronts are formed. They are the warm front and the cold front. If the cold air mass is moving towards the warm air mass, a cold front is formed and if the warm air mass is moving towards the cold air mass, a warm front is formed. And this process of formation of fronts is called as frontogenesis. See when pressure drops along the front, the warm air moves northwards and the cold air moves towards the south. And due to Coriolis force, the motion is in anti-clockwise direction. And this is how a temperate cyclone originates in normal conditions. In some special cases, when the pressure drop is very significant, that is, when the pressure difference with the high pressure and low pressure area is above 24 millibars, then we experience very strong winds. And due to the presence of such a huge pressure difference between two air masses, the speed of wind rapidly increases. And this process of rapid intensification has a name which is nothing but bombogenesis. And this leads to bomb cyclone. See the higher the pressure difference, the higher the intensity of wind will be. So basically a bomb cyclone is a highly intensive temperate cyclone that is formed due to a huge pressure difference. See in the case of cyclone Elliot which is now in the news, the pressure difference is 85 millibars and this is why the impact of this cyclone is very huge. See the Elliot cyclone caused blizzards, extreme low temperatures, near zero visibility whiteouts and ice covered roads. Here blizzards are nothing but a severe snowstorm which results in strong winds and low visibility. See, these are all the impacts of the bomb cyclone. Now, how are bomb cyclones different from normal cyclones? See, bomb cyclones are temperate cyclones that occur in the temperate region. While normal cyclones, they are tropical cyclones that occur in the tropical region. And this is the first difference. Secondly, bomb cyclones occur over both land and oceans. But the tropical cyclones, it occurs only over the oceans. When a tropical cyclone reaches the land, it starts dissipating. And we saw that this process is called as landfall, right? So this is the second difference. Thirdly, bomb cyclones impact a very huge area, but the impact of tropical cyclones is very limited. And this is the third difference. See, these are some of the differences between a normal cyclone and a bomb cyclone. Now with these points, we have come to the end of this particular news article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about air mass and we understood how temperate cyclones are formed and we saw the conditions that are needed for bomb cyclone and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the differences between bomb cyclones and normal cyclones. 
Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article. Now for our next discussion, we are going to take this text in context article. See, it talks about a case of trademark infringement filed against Sadar Laboratories Private Limited for their product Dil Afsa. See, the court ruled in the favor of Hamdard National Foundation, the makers of Ru Afsa. See, Ru Afsa is an old Sherbet brand selling their range of products. A relatively new brand, Dil Afsa, came to market with a similar product. So, the former company filed a case of trademark infringement against the later. Now, the Delhi High Court has ruled in the favor of Ru Afsa and asked the Dil Afsa to stop their protection until the disposal of the suit. And this is the background of the news article given here. Now, we'll learn about the trademark from UPSC perspective. So, what's a trademark basically? A trademark is typically a name, word, phrase, logo, symbol, design, image or a combination of these elements. Now, see this image here. Can you associate this image with anything? Yes. Once you see the symbol, you can immediately say that it is Facebook, right? And this is a trademark. Now, why do brands have trademark? Because it protects the owner against unfair competition and it prevents the damage to the reputation of owner. Suppose if you are buying a shoe from X brand which is from a well reputed company. Another counterfeit product manufacturer also puts the same logo of brand X on his low quality product. Now as a customer you will not be able to differentiate between the two products. Now if you buy the low quality shoe thinking that it's from brand X and if it did not last long then what you will do? You will spread a bad word about the brand X, right? And you will tell everyone that brand X is not good. And this would affect the sales of brand X shoes. Am I right or not? But now, if the original brand X manufacturer can file a case against the fake product maker and then it will keep away other such manufacturers from imitating the brand X logo. And now you know how it protects the owner against unfair competition and it prevents the damage to the reputation of owner. Adding to this, in a way, it ensures the consumer welfare as well. Once a trademark is fixed to a particular product, then there will be no confusion for the consumers, right? And this is about the trademark in general. Now you should know how it works in India. In India, trademarks are governed under Trademarks Act 1999. It comes under the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade under the Ministry of Commerce. See, trademark is defined in Trademark Act 1999. It is defined as a mark capable of being represented graphically and which is capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from those of others and it may include the shape of goods, their packaging and combination of colors. And such a mark may include numerous things such as signatures, names, labels, headings etc. So when can we file a case of copyright infringement? See according to the act, a trademark is infringed if the trademark is a copy of registered trademark with a few additions or alterations. So, this means that you cannot add some star to the F and say that you can use this mark. No, it is reserved for Facebook only. With few additions or alterations, you cannot say this symbol is yours. And secondly, if the infringed mark is printed or used in advertisements, then also it is said to be copyright infringement. And thirdly, if the infringed mark is used in the course of trade, if a particular trademark is used in trade, then it is also considered to be copyright infringement. And finally, if the mark used is so similar to a registered mark that it is likely to confuse a consumer while selecting a category of product, then also it is considered as infringement of copyrights. Also note that the validity period of trademark in India is for a period of 10 years as per section 25 in Trademarks Act 1999. So these are some of the important aspects that you should know about trademark.
and with this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about the background of the news article and after that we saw what is trademark and we saw why brands have trademark and after that we saw about the provisions of trademark in india the legal provisions of it and we saw the conditions which are related to the infringement of trademarks now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now let us take this business page article see this article reports about the increase in interests of government securities subsequently in terms of ownership the government of india bonds owned by rbi fell to a 2 year low of 15.3 percentage and this is due to the fact that privates are interested in buying the government securities due to increase in interests and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's learn about government securities and its types firstly let us see about the term security in the financial sense see a security is a certificate that has monetary value which can be traded this is in the financial context it is nothing but a certificate which has monetary value and this certificate can be traded and there are two types of securities which includes private and government securities see in this discussion we are going to see only about the government securities a government security which is shortly referred as gsec is a tradable instrument issued by central government or the state governments see this government security it acknowledges the government's debt obligation it is nothing but the government is obliged to pay you and such securities can be short term or long term here note that the government securities carry practically no risk of default at all and because of this reason they are called as risk free gilt edged instruments now this is about the government security let us move on to see about the types of securities as i already said the government securities are of two types one is short term securities and the other one is long term securities firstly let us see about short term securities see these short term securities are also called as treasury bills and they come in three tenures and what are those three tenures the first one is 91 days and the second one is 182 days and the third one is 365 days see the important thing that you have to note about the treasury bill is that they are zero coupon securities and they pay no interest and instead of this they are issued at a discount and they are redeemed at a face value at maturity it means they are issued at a less value and at the end of the tenure they are brought back at high value see still it may sound a little bit confusing for you i'll explain it with an example for example let us take 91 day treasury bill of rupees 100 okay and this will be issued at the rate of 98.20 rupees this means it is issued at the discount of 1.80 rupees now at the end of the tenure the treasury bill will be redeemed at the face value of 100 rupees so the government will pay you back rupees 100 and this is what is meant by issued at a discount and redeemed at face value and this is all with respect to short term securities of the government now coming to the long term securities they are called as dated securities so what are these dated securities see government paper with tenure beyond 1 year is known as dated security these securities carry either a fixed interest rate or floating interest rate and this is paid on the face value on a half early basis see generally the tenure of the dated securities ranges from 5 years to 40 years and this is all about the dated securities now let's see how these government securities are issued see government securities are issued through auctions conducted by the RBI and these auctions are conducted on the electronic platform called the eCuber which is the core banking solution platform of RBI now who are all the members of this electronic platform commercial banks 
scheduled urban cooperative banks, primary dealers, insurance companies and provident funds who maintain funds or current account and securities account with the RBI are the members of this electronic platform. See this is all about the government securities. And with this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about security in the financial context. We saw the two types of securities. In that we concentrated on government securities. We saw what is government security, the two different types of government securities. We saw what is the short term government security. Under that we saw about treasury bill. And under the long term government security we saw about dated securities. And finally we ended our discussion by seeing the platform through which the government securities are issued. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Now let us take this editorial article. See in August 15 this year 11 men who were convicted of the horrific gang rape and mass murder was released from Godra sub jail. And these men were convicted in the Bilkis Banu case. See, the release of the convicts was based on a May 2022 Supreme Court judgment. So, Bilkis Banu requested the Supreme Court to review its judgment. And the Supreme Court on December 13, 2022 dismissed her review petition. See, this editorial article discusses the various issues in the Supreme Court's dismissal of the review petition of Bilkis Banu. And we are going to see the sequence of events in this case and the points discussed in the article and finally about writ petitions in our discussion today. But before that, I have displayed here the syllabus regarding this discussion. Quickly go through it. Okay. Now let's start by looking at the sequence of events. See, after the horrific incident, Bilkis Banu approached the National Human Rights Commission and the Supreme Court. In December 2003, the Supreme Court ordered a CBI probe into the case. And in the year 2004, based on the request of Bilkis Banu, the Supreme Court ordered that the trial of the case must be taken up in Mumbai instead of Gujarat so that the judicial process is not under any external influence. And the third sequence is that in the year 2007, a trial court in Mumbai found 13 out of the 20 accused as guilty and of them 11 were awarded life sentences for their heinous crimes and 7 others were acquitted for the want of evidence. See in May 2017, the Bombay High Court upheld the conviction and life imprisonment of all 11 convicts of the Bilkis Banu case. And in July 2017, the Supreme Court also reiterated the conviction and life imprisonment of all 11 convicts of the Bilkis Banu case. But in the year 2019, one of the 11 convicts approached the Gujarat High Court seeking remission. Now you may have a question. Why did the convict file his remission petition in Gujarat High Court? See, he tried to file the remission plea in Gujarat High Court because the 1992 remission policy of Gujarat government allowed for early release of prisoners who served 14 years in jail. And this is exactly why the convict approached the Gujarat High Court. But what happened was, the Gujarat High Court in the year 2020 rejected the remission plea saying that since the case proceedings took place in Maharashtra, the remission plea should be filed in the Bombay High Court. So after this, the convict filed an appeal in the Supreme Court against the Gujarat High Court order. And the Supreme Court, after hearing the plea, gave two directions. First, the Supreme Court said that it was the Gujarat government that was competent to examine the remission plea since the crime had occurred there. The Supreme Court also said that even though the trial was held in Maharashtra, since the crime was committed in Gujarat, the policy that is applicable in the state of Gujarat only will be applicable here also. And secondly, the Supreme Court said that the 1992 remission policy of Gujarat government can be used to issue premature release of the convict. Actually, in the year 2014, the state of Gujarat issued a new remission policy. According to 2014 policy, in case of heinous crimes like rape and murder, there is no provision for premature release of the convicts. But the Supreme Court said that 
when the crime was committed in the year 2002 the 1992 remission policy only existed so based on the 1992 policy if a convict has served 14 years in prison then he may be released and these are the two directions given by the supreme court after hearing the plea and this was pronounced as judgment in may 2022 and based on this judgment the gujarat government formed a panel considering of godra collector and four other members see these four members were from ruling party and the panel anonymously decided in the favor of remission of those convicted and forwarded its recommendations to the state home department see the state government accepted the recommendation of the panel so on august 15 the 11 convicts of the bilkis banu case walked free from the godra sub jail and after this bilkis banu filed a petition in the supreme court asking it to review the may 2022 judgment and recently in december 2022 the supreme court rejected the plea of bilkis banu and this is the sequence of timeline of events that happened in the bilkis banu case see the author of this editorial cites an issue with the may 2022 judgment of the supreme court the major issue cited by the author is regarding the validity of the gujarat government to grant the remission for this the author is citing the constitution bench decision in union of india versus v shriharan 2015 case See in this case the constitution bench stated that if an offence is committed in a state A but the trial takes place and the sentence is passed in state B it is the government of state B which is the appropriate government so in the bilkis banu case it is the government of maharashtra that should have considered the remission plea and not the government of gujarat and this is the major issue see In the 1976 Madhya Pradesh versus Ratan Singh case also the court held that it is the state where the accused was convicted has the power to grant remissions for the sentences so the author states that may 2022 judgment of supreme court does not concur with the previous judgments here he goes on to say that Supreme Court had a chance to remedy its mistake but by rejecting the plea of Bilkis Banu the Supreme Court missed the opportunity and these are all the major points mentioned in the article that you should know see throughout this discussion i have mentioned remission a number of times so before concluding this discussion let us see some important points about remission firstly what is remission Remission is shortening of a sentence without changing its character. For example, if a person is sentenced to 15 years rigorous imprisonment through remission, his punishment can be reduced to say 10 years of rigorous imprisonment. Here, the nature of punishment is not changed, but the time of sentence is reduced. Now, what are all the articles that comes to your mind when you hear the word remission? it is article 72 and article 161 right see article 72 of the constitution empowers the president to grant remission and article 161 gives similar power to the governor and this is the constitutional provision regarding remission but think about it no is this the only type of remission available actually no as per law there are three kinds of remissions constitutional statutory and those earned in accordance with jail manuals see article 72 and article 161 deals with the constitutional remission and section 432 of code of criminal procedure deals with the statutory remission see it lays down rules for the state governments to suspend or remit sentences so what does this mean this means that section 432 of crpc empowers the appropriate government to suspend or remit the sentence of a prisoner section 432 clause 2 of crpc provides that the government may seek opinion of the judge who convicted the prisoner on whether the application for remission must be objected or accepted and this is about the statutory remission and the last type is the remission earned in accordance with the jail manuals see prison is the subject under the state list of the 7th schedule of the constitution so 
the management and administration of jails falls under state governments so the state government might frame rules to regulate its remission policy see we saw before itself right we saw the 1992 and 2014 remission policy of gujarat right like that each state government can frame its own policy regarding remission and this type of remission comes under remission earned in accordance with jail manuals see these are the major types of remission granted in india and this is all regarding the editorial article given here in this discussion we saw about the timeline of events that happened in the bilkis banu case and after that we saw about the major issue in the supreme court judgment cited by the author and finally we ended our discussion by seeing remission and the three types of remission which includes constitutional remission statutory remission and remission earned in accordance with the jail manuals now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now have a look at this opinion page article this news article talks about the new heritage act of telangana government see this act was enacted 5 years back and now the telangana government appears to have changed the course see the author is saying that because the telangana government started concentrating on a few premier sites outside the core heritage zone and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about the unesco world heritage sites and its eligibility criteria but before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference quickly go through it now let's start with the question what are these unesco world heritage sites see before knowing about the world heritage sites you should know about unesco See UNESCO is expanded as United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization and it was born on 16th November 1945. See it is a specialized agency of United Nations and its main objective is to promote world peace and security through international cooperation in education, arts, science and culture. See UNESCO has 195 members and 8 associate members and it is governed by General Conference and the Executive Board. See the Secretariat of UNESCO is headed by Director General and the Secretariat only implements the decision of General Conference and the Executive Board. Now this is a brief about UNESCO. Now let's move on to see about the UNESCO World Heritage Site. See the building of Aswan High Dam served as the main catalyst for the adoption of World Heritage Convention. See the Aswan High Dam is one of the world's largest embankment dams which was built across the Nile in Aswan, Egypt. See the large lake that would develop behind the new dam in Aswan would submerge and destroy many historic sites. So in order to save the historic sites and monuments of Egyptian Nubia the governments of the United Arab Republic and Sudan turned to UNESCO in the year 1959 See United Arab Republic is now Egypt and Syria okay So after this the UNESCO responded by appealing to the international community for help and this resulted in the largest archaeological rescue operation in the history So the world heritage site is nothing but an area or object inscribed in the UNESCO's world heritage list. See it can be any place or any object, but such a place or object should have outstanding value to humanity. And along with the outstanding value to humanity, it should also have distinct cultural or physical significance. Remember the sites are designated as having outstanding universal value under the convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage and this document was adopted by UNESCO in the year 1972 and it officially entered into force in the year 1975 after being ratified by 20 countries so the convention provides a framework for international cooperation in preserving and protecting the cultural treasures and natural areas throughout the world so from this what is our take away 
the places or objects having outstanding universal value are designated under the convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage which came into force in the year 1975 So under this convention UNESCO strives to encourage the conservation identification and maintenance of natural and cultural heritage around the world and this is about the UNESCO World Heritage site now how places or objects are selected for this list see to be included on world heritage list the sites must be of outstanding universal value and it should meet at least one out of the 10 selection criteria See these criteria are explained in the operational guidelines for implementation of World Heritage Convention. So what is this guideline? See World Heritage Committee is the main body in charge for the implementation of convention and they only developed precise criteria for the inclusion of properties on the World Heritage list. and these criteria serves as the guideline for the provision of international assistance under the world heritage fund and these criteria they are all included in a document called as operational guidelines for the implementation of world heritage convention see this document is regularly revised by the world heritage committee to reflect new concepts knowledge or experiences Now I have given here the 10 criteria for the assessment of outstanding universal value. You just give it a glance, okay? Read it, understand the essence of it. You need not memorize it, okay? Now coming back to the article, the article in the opinion page also says that the government have spent large sums of money on restoration of heritage sites. For example, in the year 1935 Moazam Zaghi market was restored at a cost of 16 crore and Banzilal Pet step well was restored at the cost of 2.6 crore and these large sums of money that are spent by the government did not go in vain how am i saying this see last year ramappa temple near warangal was given the unesco world heritage site and two other sites the golconda step wells and the domakonda fort were the winners in UNESCO's Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation in the year 2022 so from this we can say that the conservation efforts have led to the winning of UNESCO's Asia Pacific Awards the article also mentions that telangana is in a hurry to achieve UNESCO world heritage city status for hyderabad like the ahmedabad and jaipur and why it is doing that See, if a particular city gets the status of UNESCO World Heritage City, then it will boost tourism, right? And for that only, Telangana is in a hurry to achieve UNESCO World Heritage City status for Hyderabad. Now, here you should know about the UNESCO World Heritage City program and about the UNESCO's Asia Pacific Awards for the Cultural Heritage Conservation. Now, we'll see them one by one. Let's start with the World Heritage Cities program. See the World Heritage Cities program is formally approved and monitored by the World Heritage Committee and it came into force in the year 2001. See the main aim of the program is to assist the state parties in the challenges of protecting and managing their urban heritage. See since historic urban areas are amongst the most abundant without proper attention such an arrangement is made to protect the urban heritage. So the program is constructed along a two way process. First is the development of a theoretical framework for the urban heritage conservation and the second one is provision of technical assistance to the state parties for the implementation of new approaches and schemes. First one is theoretically you are constructing a framework and the second one is you are assisting them with the technical knowledge. So If a city is identified as world heritage city then the city will gain the broadest possible international support so this is about the world heritage cities program here i have a task for you go and find out what are all the cities in india that are recognized as the world heritage cities now let's move on to the unesco's asia pacific awards for the cultural heritage conservation see this award was started in the year 2000 
See, the purpose of the award is to recognize the efforts of private individuals and organizations in restoring, conserving and transforming structures and buildings of heritage value in the region. So, if someone is making efforts to conserve the structures or buildings of heritage value, then they should be rewarded, right? And for that only, this award was started. Know that the award consists of five categories. The first one is Award of Excellence, the second one is Award of Distinction, and the third one is Award of Merit, and the fourth one is Honorable Mention, and the fifth one is Award for New Design in Heritage Context. And the important thing that you have to know is, this year India got awards in three categories. It got the Award of Excellence for Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahalya, Mumbai, and it got the award of distinction for Stepwells of Golconda, Hyderabad. And it got the award of merit for Domukonda Fort, Telangana and Baikula Station, Mumbai. Now that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about UNESCO and also we saw about the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. We saw about the UNESCO's World Heritage Site List. And the criteria for selecting places or objects under the UNESCO's World Heritage Site List. And after that, we moved on to see about the World Heritage City Program. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the UNESCO's Asia Pacific Awards. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, take a look at this article. It reports about a recent order by SEBI for the attachment of bank and DMAT accounts of the Sahara Group to recover 6.42 crore for violating regulatory norms in the issuance of optionally fully convertible debentures. And this order by SEBI is related to a 2008-9 case. And this is the essence of this small article given here. In this context, let us learn about the terms given in the news article. First of all, let us see what is meant by DMAT account. See, DMAT account is an account that is used to hold shares and securities in an electronic format. See, the full form of DMAT account is the dematerialized account. Know that it is a necessary account to hold financial securities which may be equity or debt in a digital form. It is used not only for holding shares, but also to trade shares in the share market. See, if you want to buy shares of a company, you need to have a DMAT account. And if you don't have a DMAT account, you cannot buy any shares. In India, the DMAT accounts are maintained by two depository organizations. The first one is National Securities Depository Limited and the Central Depository Services Limited. See, a depository participant, such as a bank, acts as an intermediary between the investor and the depository organizations. And know that in India, a depository participant is described as an agent of the depository. See, here you may ask, what is a depository participant? They are nothing but banks and stock brokerage firms. See, various banks and stock brokerage firms act as the depository participant. One of the famous depository participant in India is Zeroda. And this is all about the DMAT account. Now, let's come to the next term which is nothing but the debentures. See, we have already discussed about government securities in today's discussion, right? Now, this debentures which we are going to see is a type of private security issued by the companies and private corporations. See, debentures are debt financial instruments which are issued by the private companies, but it does not require collateral or physical asset to back them up. But it is not the case with the private bonds. See, private bonds are debt financial instruments issued by large corporations and financial institutions that are backed up by collaterals or physical assets. So, this private bond is entirely different from debentures in the aspect that debentures does not require collateral or physical asset. So, what does this mean? This means that debentures are high risk instruments when compared to the private bonds because there is no collateral associated with them. Right? 
but at the same time also note that these debentures are high yielding securities when compared to the private bonds due to the amount of risk involved as we all know if more amount of risk is involved then there will be high yield right so as per this norm debentures are high yielding securities and this is all about the debentures now know that there are many types of debentures but on the basis of convertibility debentures are classified into convertible debentures and non convertible debentures now i'll explain what they are see debentures that can be converted into equity after a specific period of time is called as convertible debentures see we saw that these are securities right but if they can be converted into equity or shares then they are called as convertible debentures and further these convertible debentures are classified as fully convertible or partially convertible fully convertible means debentures are fully converted to shares partly convertible means a portion of debenture is converted to shares and the remaining part stays as security itself so this is about the convertible debentures see when it comes to convertible debentures the conversion may be either compulsory or optional so if the investors have the option of converting the debentures into shares or equity then that debenture is called as optionally fully convertible debentures and this term is only mentioned in the article here okay for explaining this term only i told you about convertible debentures fully and partly convertible debentures i hope you understand now see this is about the convertible debentures i told you there is another type right there is non convertible debentures also see this is the exact opposite of convertible debentures non convertible debentures remain as debentures itself they cannot be converted into shares or equity now that's all about this news article discussion in this discussion we discussed about two important terms that is mentioned in the article the first one is demat account and the other one is optionally fully convertible debentures now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this another front page article it reports about the speech of indian prime minister at the veer bal divas previously prime minister had announced that december 26 would be veer bal divas every year see it is done to mark the martyrdom of the 10th sikh gurus young sons baba zorawa singh and baba fateh singh the article reports about the speech of prime minister mr narendra modi at the first veer bal divas which was held yesterday and he said that the concocted history has led to the sense of inferiority complex among the younger generation and he also said that new india was correcting the mistakes of the bygone decades by restoring its long lost cultural legacy and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's learn about guru gobind singh and the contributions made by him to sikhism see before starting our discussion let's look at the term bhakti movement see bhakti movement refers to the ideas that emerged in the medieval era on love and devotion to religious concepts built around gods and goddesses so it is nothing but ideas on love and devotion to god and goddesses see this bhakti movement it preached against the caste system using the local languages we all know the significance of local languages right see only if local languages are used then the message will easily reach the masses and that's what happened here also see before the emergence of bhakti movement had more ritualistic linkages to it it means that religions means many rituals will be conducted but after the bhakti movement more personalized and devotion based worship came into existence and this devotion based worship replaced the rituals see bhakti movement in india can be broadly classified into two types one is nirguna bhakti and the other one is sarguna bhakti here nirguna bhakti means the worship of formless god without any physical form so what will be sarguna bhakti it is the practice of devotion to god in a physical form know about this background 
I'm telling you this because Guru Gobind Singh and the sect of Sikhism comes under Nirguna Bhakti category. And this is the background of Bhakti and its various types. Now let's move our attention towards Guru Gobind Singh. See, Guru Gobind Singh was the 10th and last Sikh Guru. See, he was formally installed as the leader of Sikhs when his father, who is the 9th Sikh Guru, was executed by Aurangzeb. His father was Guru Tegh Bahadur. And when he was executed by Aurangzeb, Guru Gobind Singh was formally installed as the leader of Sikhs at the age of 9 itself. So, after this, he became the 10th and final human Sikh Guru. See, he had four biological sons and they all died in the Guru Gobind Singh lifetime itself. Two of the sons died in battle and the remaining two were executed by the Mughal governor Wazir Khan. The article reports about the execution of two of his sons by the order of Aurangzeb that we saw in the introduction, right? See, the two sons, namely Baba Zorava Singh and Baba Fateh Singh, they were forced to convert to Islam by Aurangzeb's men. When the young children declined, they were executed. And to commemorate the valour of these young children only, Veer Bal Divas was celebrated yesterday. And this is about the article. Now coming to the contributions of Guru Gobind Singh to the Sikh religion. See, Guru Gobind Singh was the Guru who organised the Sikh community into a warrior class called the Khalsa. Guru Gobind Singh created and initiated the Khalsa as a warrior community with the duty to protect the innocent from religious persecution. See, the founding of Khalsa started a new phase in Sikh tradition. See, it contains an initiation ceremony and rules of conduct for the Khalsa warriors. Additionally, the Khalsa provided political and religious vision for the Sikh community. And this is all about Khalsa which was initiated by Guru Gobind Singh. Now coming to the next important contribution, see the concept of five K's was introduced by him. He commanded the Khalsa Sikhs to always wear the five K's. See the five K's were nothing but Kesh, Kanga, Kirpan, Kachera and Kara. Kesh is nothing but unshaved hair and beard. Kanga is nothing but comb for the Kesh. Usually it is made of wood. And Kirpan is the small curved sword of any size, shape or metal. And Kachera is short breeches. And Kara is a bracelet usually made of iron or steel and it is worn on the wrist. See, these five Ks need to be worn by a practicing Sikh all the time. And this concept was introduced by Guru Gobind Singh to distinguish the Sikhs from other people. And it was also introduced to instill a sense of brotherhood among the Sikhs community. So, these are all the important contributions of Guru Gobind Singh to Sikhism. Now, coming to the importance of these contributions. See, with the creation of Khalsa, Guru Gobind Singh abolished all the existing social divisions in line with the teachings of Guru Nanak Dev. Who is Guru Nanak Dev? He is the first Sikh Guru. And this led Sikhism to develop as a religion which promoted social oneness and togetherness. And this is the significance of contribution of Guru Gobind Singh. And with this, we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Bhakti movement, its types. We saw about Guru Gobind Singh, how his son died in his lifetime. And after that, we moved on to see some important contributions of Guru Gobind Singh to Sikh religion. And we ended our discussion by seeing the significance of the contributions of Guru Gobind Singh. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, this is the last article for today's discussion. This news article reports about a warning given by National Commission for Protection of Child Rights to civil society organizations. See, what the civil society organizations did was, for the sake of fundraising, they used representative visuals depicting the development issues like malnutrition. So, the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights issued a directive to the non-governmental organizations, NGOs, not to depict vulnerable children and rice fund. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through 
NCPCR. See, National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, it is abbreviated as NCPCR. Know that it is a statutory body set up in the year 2007 under the Commissions for Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. See, it is under the administrative control of the Ministry of Women and Child Development. See, the Commission's mandate is to ensure that all laws, policies, programs and administrative mechanisms are in line with the child rights perspective as enshrined in the Constitution of India and also in the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. Here, by the word child, whom does the Act refer to? For that, you should know the definition of child. See, a child is defined as a person between the age group of 0 to 18 years. And this is a brief about the NCPCR. Now, moving on to the functions and powers of NCPCR. See, under the Right to Education Act 2009, NCPCR can inquire into complaints about violation of law. It can summon an individual and it can demand evidence. And it also can seek a magisterial inquiry, it can file a writ petition in High Court or Supreme Court, it can approach the government concerned for the prosecution of the offender, it can recommend interim relief to those affected. So these are all the powers of NCPCR under the Right to Education Act 2009. See apart from this, it also monitors the implementation of Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012. Now, this is about the functions and powers of NCPCR. Now, talking about the composition of the commission, see this commission has a chairman and six members of which at least two should be women. All of them are appointed by central government for three years. The maximum age to serve in commission is 65 years for chairman and 60 years for the members. See, as I already said, the chairman and other members hold office for a period of three years. And also know that the chairman and members shall not hold office for more than two terms. Okay. And the salary, allowances and other terms and conditions of service for the chairperson and members shall be prescribed by the central government. So that's all regarding this NCPCR that is the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. See, in this discussion, we saw about NCPCR. It is a statutory body set up under Commissions for Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. We saw about the definition of child. We saw about the powers of NCPCR under Right to Education Act 2009. And we saw the important functions of NCPCR. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the composition of the commission. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. See aspirants, today we have five prelims questions. I will solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now, let us take this first question. Consider the following conditions. Statement 1. Warm air mass meets cold air mass during peak of winter. Statement 2. Frontogenesis results in the formation of cold front and warm front. Statement 3. There is a pressure drop by at least 24 millibars. The above condition leads to which of the following cyclone? Option A. Tropical cyclone. Option B. Temperate cyclone. Option C. Bomb cyclone. And Option D. Super cyclone. See, we have discussed about this elaborately in our bomb cyclone discussion. Think about it. All these conditions are the requirements for the occurrence of bomb cyclone. So, the correct answer to this question is option C, bomb cyclone. Now, moving on to the second question. See, this is a previous question which was asked in the year 2018. Consider the following statements. Statement 1. The Reserve Bank of India manages and services the Government of India securities but not any state government securities. See, this statement is incorrect. See, flotation of state government loans, also known as state development loans, are done by RBI as per the RBI Act 1934. And the RBI may by agreement with any state government undertake the management of public debt of a state. Accordingly, the RBI has entered into agreements with 29 state governments and one union territory, that is Union Territory of Puducherry, for the management of their public debt. 
So the statement one is incorrect because it says that RBI manages and services only government of India securities and not any state government securities. Now coming to statement two, treasury bills are issued by government of India and there are no treasury bills issued by the state government. See in India, the central government issues both treasury bills and bonds or the dated securities, while state governments issue only bonds or the dated securities, which are also called as state development loans. So statement two is correct. Now coming to statement three, treasury bills offer are issued at a discount from the par value. See this is correct. This we saw in our discussion itself. Treasury bills are issued at a discount from the par value. So the correct answer to this question is option C, 2 and 3 only. Now moving on to the third question. See this is also a previous year question which was asked in the year 2021. With reference to India, consider the following statements. Statement 1. Retail investors through DMAT account can invest in treasury bills and government of India debt bonds in primary market. See here the keyword is retail investors. See, Government of India allowed the retail investors to invest in treasury bonds from the year 2021. It was already allowed for the individual investors to invest in the Government of India bonds. So, the statement 1 is correct. Now, coming to statement 2, the negotiated dealing system order matching is a government securities trading platform of the Reserve Bank of India. See, this statement is correct. It is a government securities trading platform of Reserve Bank of India. If we know that these two statements are correct, we can easily say that the correct answer is option B, 1 and 2 only. See, for our clarification, let's see the statement 3 also. The Central Depository Services Limited is jointly promoted by Reserve Bank of India and Bombay Stock Exchange. See, this statement is incorrect because the Central Depository Services Limited was promoted by Bombay Stock Exchange, but later it divested its stakes among the nationalized banks. So the statement saying that CDSL is jointly promoted by RBI and Bombay Stock Exchange is incorrect. It was promoted by Bombay Stock Exchange, but now it divested its stakes among the nationalized banks. So the correct answer to this question is option B, 1 and 2 only. Now moving on to the next question, arrange the following Sikh Gurus chronologically. Guru Nanak, Guru Tegh Bahadur, Guru Har Gobind, Guru Arjan Dev. See if you had listened to our discussion very carefully, you should know that Guru Tegh Bahadur will come at the last because there is no Guru Gobind Singh, right? He is the last Sikh Guru. So if he is not here in the option, then Guru Tegh Bahadur will only come at the last. So, by doing this, we can easily eliminate option C and D. Know that Guru Arjan Dev was before Guru Har Gobind. See, Guru Arjan Dev was the fifth Sikh Guru, while Guru Har Gobind was the sixth Sikh Guru. We all know who is the first Sikh Guru, right? It was the Guru Nanak. So, what is the correct chronological order here? It is 1, 4, 3 and 2. So, the correct answer to this question is option B. 1, 4, 3 and 2. See aspirants, I have given here the list of the Sikh Gurus in the chronological order. Go through this and also note the contemporary Mughal ruler to the Sikh Gurus. It will be very helpful in your prelims examination. Okay. Now let us move on to the final question. See aspirants, this is only the quiz question for you. Pause the video, think about the question for a minute and post your answer in the comment section. Aspirants, I have displayed here the practice mains questions. So, interested people, write it and post your answer in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar AS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.